Okay, let's start, guys. Those who join us after the workshop, I have a quick um, comment for you. I was here from the very morning, actually participating in all the, all the meetings, all the sessions, and they were absolutely fantastic. I think they were not just informational, but also very informative. This is, this is about the title of this. When Pavel Novak called me a couple of days ago and, prepared, and actually proposed to join you in this conference, I actually I said, what about Buddhist meditation and customer experience? And Pavel said, it's okay. So, so, so then I prepared a couple of slides and I checked with my mentor, who is the typical British grumpy manager. So I sent him a link to this conference and I sent him my presentation. And he said, I, I don't know. You, know you, you basically say how, how human experience is being generated, how emotions are generated, and how you can generate emotions for specific purposes and, and basically how, how to create value for the customer. So don't, don't you think it's a very basic thing and everybody will know it. And I think, I think this is exactly what I wanted to do. Why, this is why we have the second title because he said your presentation is like a primer on perception for the hardcore IT professional you were a couple of years ago. So basically this presentation is basically what Bartosz wanted from the uh, communication design presentation, that he wanted to ignite some passion or interest in those who don't know what the customer experience or user experience is. And also I think Pavel was quite passionate about people who never heard about customer experience but might be very interested in to jump into the uh, domain. Uh, now, a couple of things about me. This was about the presentation for the financial kind of uh, context and I have some links with finance actually in Poland. I was the project manager for the Citibank lounge which was maybe 12 or more years ago when there was no Citigroup yet and then for the couple of years I worked for HSBC when I was running major projects for them over the last couple of years and these projects were quite interesting. They were basically a huge learning experience for me. And this is basically a couple of slides from the session which was very interesting within HSBC in 2009. We got a new executive who is nominated as a head of uh, personal finance, finance services and actually he brought us to the session he called building customer centered culture. And this is the slide he prepared. This is basically my redrawing on the flip chart because I wanted to represent it for you. But what he did, he put IT in the middle and then he said we have operations, we have uh, standards compliance, finance, marketing and then somewhere we have sales channels. And in the original flip chart, which was created, actually there was no space for this little blue man, which is the customer. And I was so fascinated about this, because I was the IT, and I was in the middle of it. But it didn't last very long, because he actually replaced this with this one. And he said, guys, this is not sustainable. We can't work like that. IT is not in the middle. Our customer will be in the middle. And all of you, finance, marketing, whoever have you, you have to work together to deliver to this customer. This was the guy who did it, Raghur Narula. He is now the head of the personal finance in Turkey. He was the person who actually brought me into the customer experience domain. He was my first mentor. And he gave me a couple of books. He got me to, the mess, to the, his office after the session. He told me, do you want to run it for me? And I said, not knowing what it is, I said, yes. But he gave me a couple of really months of good coaching and then we got it running. Now, let's, let's go to the first section of this, and I want to explain to you what the customer experience is. There are many definitions, as you might know, but my favorite will be like that. From the psychological perspective, uh, customer experience is, the, first of all, is an interaction between the organization and the customer. And most importantly, as perceived through the customer conscious and subconscious mind. It is like in the last presentation, it's not how, how IT or even you, you know, design unit uh, understands what, what the customer thinks, it's what the customer thinks. And you will find this uh, also popular, that it is a blend or combination of an organization rational performance and sensory stimulation to evoke design behavior by emotions, measured against customer expectations across all touch points. We, we met this touch point concept today constantly, and I will uh, go back to this later. Now, value orientation of this definition is that uh, customer experience is the market differentiator or source of sustainable competitive advantage, turning customers into advocates. Who are the advocates? Advocates are people who love your company, love your brand, and give you free marketing. They talk to others and they want them to buy your products. 
Also, these are people who are extremely forgiving. If you have a mishap and your application on something doesn't work, they will forgive you because they are advocates, they love you. And then, of course, it is a pragmatic, uh, is a pragmatic in producing results way of applying and maintaining what this customer centricity is in the, in practice. And I have two uh, qualifications to this slide. Over the next couple of slides, you will see most of the graphics. This was presented by the Beyond Philosophy. This is the company in the UK who is absolutely customer centric, and they wrote, especially Colin Shaw, who is the manager of this company, lots of book on customer experience. And I will give you the link to this company. You can call them uh, to the mobile of Kalina Janewska and talk to them uh, to get more of them. Also, if you, if you read like customer experience, you can also say that this is about the user and the application. So this is about user's experience as he uses your application. So basically the framework which is created around the customer experience and organizational interaction between the customer and the organization is the same thing about the user and the application. Now, this is a typical, typical presentation of what uh, Beyond Philosophy calls natural, uh, naive to natural model. And you will see a couple of axes here, and the vertical is about you know, how the evolution goes into the uh, focus of customer experience from the product, physical, emotional, and sensory components or attributes of the product. In the rightmost, uh, I can't have, don't have a pointer, but this, this axis on the right is about the customer focus. Are they focused on the customer or they are not? And you will see four layers there, or four evolution stages from naive, transactional, enlightened, and natural. And what this basically is, oh, super, thank you. Well, you have suppressed, yeah? Okay, perfect. So this is about the, uh, this is about the naive status where the company actually uh, focuses on the product itself, its physical features. Now it is about the uh, transactional, when you have physical but also services. It's kind of going into the, what is customer relation, when you have com enlightened company which is building on emotional linking, which leads to long-term relationship, and so on. Natural is where you have the customer experience as a focus, with a high focus on customer, and it's about the sensory input of your applications or products. And I've summarized it not in the Beyond Philosophy, but maybe my plainer English representation that on the naive level, basically what you do, ignore the customer. You just focus on your product. In the transactional, you have the still focus on the physical aspects of the product, and but you actually are react to customer, not proactively, reactively, meaning after the past, pa fact. Now you go into enlightened when you have the huge change because it's the proactivity towards the customer and the emotional engaging of the customer experience. Of course, this might also mean there's about the way your application presents itself to the customer or the user. And natural, when you have a total proactivity, total focus on the customer, and when you actually design the experience by triggering and get generating specific emotions uh, or specific sensory attributes of your application to trigger these emotions. And I will tell you how to do this in a minute. Now, there's a fundamental book you probably have to read. This is the DNA of customer experience and how emotions create or drive value. It is Colin Scher's book, which uh, collects two or three years of clinical data, where they were checking which type of emotions have impact on the customer value, or the value of a relationship between the customer or user and your application. And there are obviously four clusters, and the one which actually gives you a success, meaning the customers will stay with you, will your product, is the advocacy cluster. This is where the customer are happy or pleased. And we don't have time here to go through all of this, but basically what it boils down to, that you will have what they call uh, emotional signature uh, kind of chart, where you have a landscape of the key emotions known to drive the value of the business. So advocacy, recommendation, attention, destroying. So you have named 20 different emotions, which if you trigger in the, your customer's mentality, it will either make them into advocate or they will make, make them to leave you and maybe destroying you by blackmailing you or telling others how horrible you are. It's very difficult to recover from something like that. Normally you will have a way of actually checking this status by going through these 20 emotions and actually checking where you are. It is best done if you do this not by your own team, but you do this with your sampled customer representation. And what is most interesting is that 
within this all four layers of the evolution, which I ask you to, to have a look at, is that the naive organization is scoring very high on the destructive emotions, very low on the positive ones, and of course, going through the evolution, you will see the actual reversal of it with the natural organization, when they score very high on all these emotions which have the advocacy aspect of this, and very low on the destroying factor. Now, let's go quickly to something which is extremely important, it's basically a major part of what I want to say, is what is experience? You use this user experience, customer experience all the time, but how it is defined? I haven't heard today a definition which I'll be happy with. You were referring to this, but do you actually know what it is? Uh, so, I will have two themes. The first one, I will basically tell you subjective experience as a data information processing aspect, and then I will give you something very paradoxical, which is that subjective experience is basically something which your mind-body process generates, telling you about the past, in the present, but to prepare you for the future. So there is an intention, intentionality within the experience. And it's so important because it is about how you can actually model experience of your customer to bring him up in this emotional signature ladder to actually go with him into the advocacy, advocacy cluster. This, this, is, this is the, uh, maybe not so nice chart, but which I prepared for, for you guys. And this is, this is the situation with a photo camera and the rose. I, I tried to find some Japanese make for, for this camera, and I thought that by make Kato, my, my, my sound like Japanese, but basically it's Katowice. But what this basically is that, look at this from the psychological perspective. What happens in this situation is that the user selects the program. It might be landscape, sport, whatever, portrait. So this kind of prepares the camera to select how it will deal with the situation. Then obviously you have an exchange between the camera and the object by measurements, which are going on about the light, distance, things like that. Then obviously the third one is that the camera, based on these measurements and selected program, will adjust its chips and everything which is there to be ready to go to point number four, which is basically capturing the site according to parameters which were there. And obviously five is actually flashing this you know, after some processing to the memory card, so you have a photo. So basically what it tells you is that the old books which were presenting photo camera as a depiction of the human eye or the human brain is absolutely nonsensical because the camera is not a passive rep uh, reproductive process which takes the object from the external reality and make a one-to-one -one copy somewhere on the paper or something like the uh, matrix of, of, of the magnetic part of the, of the camera. This is highly processed process where whatever is the result depends on how it was actually processed, how it was generated. Now if you look at human, uh, this is the guy coming there seeing the guitar. It doesn't matter if it is a real or not or imagined guitar, but what's really happening for the human it's, it's, it's about similar, meaning that you have this capturing of information, some processing, representation, and then there's a new element, which is action. And if you are into user experience, I would hope that you have heard the name of the Donald Norman, who is like the guru of the entire discipline. So if you like books like Emotional Design or Complexity, Living with Complexity and things like that, then you will know the guy. But this is the book which he wrote in 68, which is, you can't remember even when it was, but the gist of it is, was actually quoted by the, the another hero of this discipline, which is Mr. Uh, yeah, Dan Daniel Goldman, who is basically known for the mar work marketed a series of books on emotional intelligence. And basically this is about what happens in this situation. And this, this is so, so important. This is a stimulus, which is means something which is visible there, sending some input to the human senses. And then what's happening is that we have this obvious illusion that what is be, you know, ahead of us, we see it, that we are aware of it. There's nothing which is further from the truth, because what happens, and this is proven clinically, is that this stimulus goes to what I call sensory store and filter. This is what the presentation here today was about perception. If you were attentive about this distance and, and other things, it is what's going on here. But even before it goes to awareness, which is the place where we are aware of what's going on, there is a long-term memory interaction, which means that whatever comes in through the senses goes to memory and then only is flashed to awareness and only then the human responds. And this is, I think, I, I, I made a scan of this uh, page in the book because it's so similarly important that you really should copy it and remember. Uh, memory screens perception 
at the earliest stage of information flow, filtering for salience, what is allowed through awareness. So you are not aware of things which will be filtered out by your senses or your memory. And I will tell you in a minute how it works. But this is very important. This, is like, this, this model is like about the camera. The light processing flashing to the memory. For the human is different because it is flashed to, to, to awareness for a purpose, to generate response. And if you don't understand this mechanism, you can't deal with your customers. Because you can't deal with the process of how they will respond to what they see or experience as your product. Okay? Now, there, you obviously, if you don't play games, you, you will not see this picture. But this is about what is called flight simulator. This is a very popular term when you have a device where the pilot will sit on, 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 on some special, in a special environment here, and you have the visual and other experience of actually flying a jet and fighting. And obviously, uh, it was like, interesting, we, when I graduated from, uh, from the university, I was working on dynamics of this type of device. And I always thought that I am modeling the movement of the jet. And actually, I was never told it's not the truth. I only learned it up to maybe 10 or 15 years later when I got into customer experience. Because what is happening here, that this is a device which is not a flight simulator. It is a flying experience simulator. So what is going on is that this device cannot move like this one. It cannot do rotations, it cannot do angle accelerations. What we can do is just, a fly, is, is just move as this small devices here allow it. But the point is that the guy who is sitting here as a, as a fly, uh, jet fr uh, fighter pilot, he will have the same experience, visual and others, as he would be here. This is why you simulate basically not the flight of the, simula of the, of the jet, you, s you simulate his experience. And now the question to you is that if you have a product, like a banking product, like this credit card shown here in the last presentation, what this credit card is doing? Is it just flushing money out of ATM? Or maybe it is bringing the assurance that, oh, I'm saving. Oh, I am in the Hong Kong or somewhere, and I can get my money. So this is about creating experience, what the product brings. So you know, credit card is a simulator of certain designed experience. Uh, what is important is to make a feeling of something, n not showing that the really how it works internally. But it's uh, if you do some expression of 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 it. Mm -hmm. It's it's enough. So mm -hmm. so it's not about uh, this, uh, for example, real uh, acceleration of the plane. But what you feel is real acceleration yeah. is really important. Yeah. So it's and about this. Uh, it's really funny when you see this guy sitting in the in the simulator. He will have this special dress, and this dress will have uh, attached lots of equipment. So for example. If they take off, he will really think, think like, feel like he's like 2G or 5G acceleration and they actually can make themselves puke or they, they can lose consciousness because they really feel like they are in the plane. And the, the whole simulation is the layer of the feeling and experience. So if, if you run projects as project managers, you will know the trick. You, have, you are the actor, you are the project manager. And what you do, you present the status of your project in some dashboard and your intention is what? To present the reality of the project? Maybe. Most of the time what you want to do, you want to trigger positive responses from the sponsor so you can actually continue your project. So what you are doing, you are presenting with intention. Your method will be some status uh, report, some dashboard, and data sources will be obviously in the project situation about the past, which is metrics and tracking information, historical data, and about the future, the list of future milestones, whatever should happen. And delivery context will be, of course, organizational culture, policies, resources. Now, the same picture, hijacking your attention to focus on this. This is the other product on ACTA, which is the mind-body system, which I call project manager of your experience. And now, the goal intention here is to direct subjects' attention being here to mobilize your resources to ma maximize survival fitness. And survival fitness might be whatever you, it is that you want to do. The same happens in the customer's head because the mechanism of perception will put into his awareness whatever is relevant in terms of the product. But let's com uh, complete the loop. The method is that representation experiences subjective reality to trigger required response. And uh, these words are heavy and important because what we are aware of is a construction. 
It's not. It's all like in this camera. It's it's not what is there. It's what was what came from the programming through the data selection transformation based on the project filters and everything in. So what we are aware of is a construction. And then data sources will be past memories and future memories. Past memories, whatever we experience and remember or don't remember. The future memories, what we expect of the future, even doesn't matter if we are aware of it or not. I don't want to talk about subconscious mind here because everybody of you knows we have one, but it is not the point here. In delivery context, values, beliefs, habits, and whatever is a part of your makeup or the makeup, psychological makeup, makeup of your customer. So basically, to sum it up, there is some external event, which might be, for example, first opening screen of your application. What happens is that the eyes see it, but the mind doesn't see it yet. What happens is that these applications go to what I call filters and modifiers in your head. This actually relates to the same thing which is in this camera, which you remember. And then obviously based on the uh, filters and modifiers in your mind, what you actually see is the internal representation of this internal event. So obviously if it's a very simple, ex uh, I don't know, web-based uh, interface, you see it, obviously you see it as it looks like, but the entire emotional state and physiology which is around it is actually internally generated by your head, not by the person who designed and deployed this interface. And obviously only when you are aware of this mental state, internal representation, you respond to this event. Now let's, let's put it under magnifying glass. As I said, external event, being it a web interface or whatever your application might be, goes into your mind. And then now what happens? There are three processes, and these processes are deletion, generalization, and distortion. Deletion means some information is being deleted from what came in. Some information is generalized. Some information is distorted, meaning modified. I will explain the three processes in a minute. But what these processes are working on is values, beliefs, past memories, future memories. What is value? Value is not some ethical, moral thing which people have in their heads. It might be, but in terms of your situation with the customer, is it what it is that is the value your customer assigns to what's happening. So what is his expectation of, for example, interaction with your application? What is value? or is what is valuable for him in this application. The belief is his understanding of what is the world of possibility and impossibility. What is that he expects, what is that he believes your application can be able to deliver to him, what it can do or what it can do. If he has a high expectations and beliefs in terms of the potency of your application and he cannot get his stuff to the shopping uh, basket, I think it, 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 it then will generate negative emotion. Past memories, as I said, this is what happened and what is remembered or not in his memory. There are many things in my life I don't remember. There is a saying that if you, if you remember the 60s, you were not there. Yeah? So there are certain things which I don't know, it was a dream or it was a real thing, I, I can't say or I don't remember. There are certain things we repress. For example, you have a stressful event in your life, but you will not remember it because it is repressed by your memory but it will still be there in your neurology and psychologically will affect the whole mechanism. This is why people pay hundreds of pounds talking to psychiatrists and coaches to remove some past memories which are not consciously remembered but affect their life. Uh, future memories is about what it is that people expect and believe is about for them in the future. Meta programs. Every, every person has a way of interacting with the world and the, the lady who was presenting on, on perception is probably an absolute expert there, but you know, even at the simple level, if you have a customer, you will have people who want to have a very simple interface like Apple, which you uh, kindly mentioned. Now, there are people who want detail, they want lots of options. And if you go to uh, YouTube uh, lectures by Don Norman on, design, on emotional design, he will actually give you the samples of the simple interfaces in the UK banking, like First Direct, for example, and enormously complex uh, sites in the Asian banks, where not only you have these Asian characters nobody can read, but it's just lots of it on the screen, and they feel absolutely comfortable with this. There are different meta programs, people have different uh, likings in terms of what they want to see, how they want to absorb information. I have a manager who is a uh, big chunk guy. He, d he likes everything, give me, give me the summary. But I also work with people who will never uh, you know, accommodate any 
any hijack information. They, they want, give me the detail first, then I will build this you know, entire thing myself in my head. So, so you have to be conscious that people will have different meta programs, and you have an application which has to deal with all of them, you have to find some middle, middle kind of golden middle to, to, to satisfy them. Language patterns is we, we can't cover today, but the language is basically what is the model of experience. We use the language to experience what's happening in our heads. And uh, uh, the way you use text in your applications can also be extremely important, but we can't cover it now. Now, deletion, distortions, uh, generalizations. This is the, this is the uh, tube in London. I couldn't use also uh, because it will be just a one straight line. <laughs> We're not very, not, not very eventful. But what it is here is that, you know how many pubs are in England, in, in London? Pubs, you know pubs? I don't remember. There were, I was in many, but there were, there is more, more to explore. There's none of them here. It's a deletion. Why? Because for the traveler who wants to get from Rickmansworth to Canary Wharf, it's immaterial. How many pubs are there and where they are? So this is deletion, deleted information which is not relevant. And people who are your users, they will delete from your applications whatever which they think is not relevant to them. So you put it there, they will not see it. Now, generalization is about making a rule to make it simpler. For example, do you think that all the stops, for example, on the Metropolitan Line are of the same length? Of course, they are not. So this is generalized. I said, OK, I would say and assume for this map that the distance is the same, because whatever these uh, people are caring for is that what is the sequence in which I will be you know, encountering the stops? And obviously, distortion uh, other simplifications, like do you mean the Thames is, looks like that in London? Of course it is not. So it is simplification for the purpose of making the, the map simple, understandable. And, and this is why I'm coming to a very important mantra, which you should probably learn very well, is that the map is not the territory. We actually could be quite, quite, quite proud because this, this is the term which is very popular and it was turned by uh, Alfred Kozybski, who is the Polish in engineer and scientist of the early years of the century. So he said the map is not the territory, meaning that the way we represent the world is not the world itself. You can't eat the menu. The menu is just about the meal you can eat and so on. Now, the very important thing which your customers are doing and you are doing when you are customers and normal professional human beings is that you don't respond to the world as it is. You, you respond to the world through the map of the world you have in your head. If you are, it doesn't matter if you are conscious of it or not, or you know what the map is or not, you never have a direct impact on the world, you never respond to the world. This is why the same things will create different responses from different people. The same woman might be beautiful for this guy, but this guy wouldn't even have a look. This car might be so sexy for some people, but others would say, it's so nonsensical, why, why it is so, you know, I can't even get into this. Like, I, I saw the scene in, in, in Russia when I was running the project for HSBC there. There is a, there's a place when you can buy Maserati three o'clock in the morning. We're coming back from the party, for the project party, and actually I saw the scene where there was like, quite rich guy with, with a beautiful woman and they were buying Maserati and she was she was very she said why don't we have a normal Honda so I can get in because it was just not comfortable for them so, so different perceptions and this is important per since perception is a process with a structure it can be intentionally designed so what I'm trying to tell you here is that because emotions are so important to drive the value of your application for the customer you better know how to use the structure of perceptional process so that you can generate emotions the way it will drive this value for the customer. And this is my, my next section, which is, what is emotion? Uh, there are two themes. The emotion as a left, as a felt difference between the map and the territory, and designing experience, orchestrating emotions. Hopefully you enjoyed this one as well, which is the pictorial representation of what is emotion. I, this is the concept which was coined by one of my mentors, uh, Michael Hall, who basically said that some map of reality if you're in your head, and maybe your expectations is that I will have a silver, green, and yellow balls there, and I want to pull them. 
Reality will be give you this. You will pull off the reality something which you didn't expect, something you didn't want. There will be lots of things there which we even notice, which is this filtering process I was talking about. So your experience of territory, which is real world, might be very different from the map of it you have in your head. And it really doesn't matter if it is, posit it is up or down. The point is that there is a difference, and you will feel this difference in your body as emotion. Emotion is a body sense of the difference between your expectation and understanding of what the world should be in your map of the world and the actual experience of this world when you get to the, uh, to the situation. If I have the expectation of the word processor, that it will do word processing for me, and if I, could, uh, you know, I want to put a text box, it will actually sit there, and I go to Microsoft Word, and I try to do this, and I have to know that in order to resize the, the text, which is rectangle on the shapes insert box, I have to go to the properties, and I have to go to the text box properties, and I have to so say not adjust to the size of the, of the, of the text, then obviously my, my, my experience is very low, because I have to have additional knowledge which is irrelevant from the point of view what I wanted to do on my map. Do you understand this? And there's a couple of useful ways of looking at emotions. And uh, really, uh, you will find on the last slide, and hopefully you will get this presentation, there's a whole list of good books on emotions. And you will learn from Damasio or Joseph Deleuze what emotions are. And you will have like 600 pages discussion as to if, if I see a bear, I run, of it, I run from it because I'm scared of it, or first I'm scared of it, and then I run. So you, you, you will have lots of uh, conflicting, conflicting models which will try to explain to you how emotions are generated, you know, what is the order with which are generated. I, I'm not the psychologist. What I'm saying to you is if you are a user experience, guys, you need just to understand that emotion or the way of thinking about emotion is useful to you if you understand that there is a difference which was, was, was in the head or rep internal representation of the situation and the actual impact when experienced. And uh, yes, well, to, your, to your presentation, th this is about, we are not declaring here how things are. We are talking about the mind sets, about the ways of looking at things. There's a process. Thinking is a process. Thinking has a behavior. If you have a shitty input, you'll have shitty output. If you have a shitty process, you'll have a shitty perception. And sorry for using the word, but I want you to remember, and I do this on purpose, I want you to remember, if you want to have an accurate representation of reality, accurate in double quotes, you have to take care, you have to bring it to your awareness at what is sitting there in my beliefs, values, memories, so that I experience it as it is. Maybe side question, who, who believes on his first impression? Say you see somebody and you think, that's a nice person. Or is a horrible person. Who of you believes in this first impression? Most of you, yeah, because it is natural. I learned never to do this because it's always wrong. It's always wrong because I always find out that people are excellent. <laughs> so, so if I have the first impression that they were okay, I'm okay. But sometimes I think, oh, I, it looks like you know I dealt with somebody like that. No, never. Everybody is different. So this is this 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 learning. Now, so you. We can think about emotion as a result of unconscious evaluation of a difference between the map and the territory. And in English, it is really fantastic because you have the root, motion, and you can actually see this, that the, 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 the word was generated to suggest that you feel it because the body wants you to, mo to move, to do some motion, to do some action. So emotions are triggers, triggered for, triggers for action. Uh, I thought it would be lots of finance people here, so I, I coined the metaphor that the same way you have futurist options and other derivative instruments in the market, emotions are derivatives of the map of reality you have. But I think I will not uh, pursue this because it is, uh, we don't have this, this type of finance guys here at the moment to make it useful. But this is very important. Emotions can be fed back into the system and, and then actually trigger emotions about the emotions. So. First of all, emotion is not a part of reality. It's something you generated. So you tell me, this is a boring talk. Or you might say, no, it is interesting talk. I might say, both of you are, are probably 
Correct, but the point is that it is not, not the talk which is interesting. What's actually happening is that you are listening to the talk, you have some expectation and level of understanding, and based on this, your body might generate the feeling, oh, it sounds different, or it sounds interesting, or it is boring, because you didn't expect this type of a talk here. So this is, this is common fallacy in the language that have the qualification, emotional qualification put as a part of reality, which it is never part of reality, it is the derivative, is the interpretation of reality. But this is important, because if you, if you use your application, or the customer is using an application, that they have emotion of being frustrated, now they will not respond to your application, they will respond to this frustration. They will say, it is frustrating, horrible, I will never use it, and I will email all my friends, all my friends never to use it. So there's a destructive uh, potential of emotion, which can be also on the positive flip side, that if they are happy, they will continue using it, and, and they will be basically telling everybody how good it is. So maybe last thing about emotions. Emotions are not the part of the territory, but the subjective experience. Mind-body generates them to move you towards the action. And the last point here, because I'm declining this derivatives thing, this is a very popular model of generating motivation and continuity of action, which was coined by Vroom, called expectancy theory of motivation. And it's very, sim it's very simple. And if you use it when you do your user applications, then, then you will never be in problem or in, in difficulty. People in their heads, your customers, have this process going on. And the process is as follows. They exercise effort, so they do things with your applications. They use it, they click it. If they expect that this clicking will drive them into performance, which is useful, so that it will give them outcomes they expect, and these outcomes are valuable to them, they will continue. So if I go to the Amazon.com, I select my books, and I know that I will, it's worthwhile, because if I do this, it's simple, I will get eventually my book which is valuable to me, I will do this. But if, you go to, if I go to certain e-banks and try to get transaction done, and I exercise the effort, I do things they told me, and at some time they don't want lots of data which I don't have on my on me, but it should be in the database, then I think, no, this performance will never give me the outcome, so I will drop. Or the wait time is too long. Or people get bored. So if they, if they can maintain this entire link of motivation, they will just drop out of your process. It's extremely important. Do you have any questions on this? I doubt. There are no doubts. The, this is the classical touch point or customer journey from, from Lego. And uh, not into, not, I'm not going into all the details of this, but what I want to tell you is that <sighs> when you design the customer experience, you try to understand what are the, way, the things that might happen as the customer goes before, during, and after the act of, of interacting with you. And you will try to find all the meaningful moments which you can turn into the positive experience. You will find those which can a potential uh, for problem, for, for something which might be a negative experience. So, so this is what, what you do. This is, you, you plan the customer journey, and I think you, you, many of you actually explained it very well in, in the previous presentations. But what is the principle here? The principle is that in terms of creating uh, proper customer journey. What you want to do, you want to apply your creativity innovation to generate relevant future memories in your client's map of the product. So this was already discussed, that in order to create an emotion, it will go into the customer's head and it will interact with the future and past memories. If you can create a proper future memory, which means you can represent the program in the customer's head, you will not compete against his stochastic moods or states in a particular moment. You are trying to deliver your product, which is there to meet the expectation which was promised or expected of your product, as maybe your marketing was able to put into future memories. This can be done by the marketing, but also you have a properly written application. You want the customer to learn 
the moment he starts using your application. So you want to be consistent. There be, should be one way of using menus, of using list boxes, and looking for information. So even I when the customer starts interacting with your application, you actually then create future memories, so it goes into the muscle memory, and they know what to do next. And of course, how to do this? Associate positive, uh, positive emotional states to touch points, which is all these elements in the customer journey, and moments of truth primed in customer's map of your product. What is the moment of the truth, or moment of truth? Moment of truth is the, the actual moment where, during the touch point, which is the specific interaction between your user and your application, something is significantly important and is taken as a snapshot of this entire interaction. If the guy spent 20 minutes to get the shopping basket, in the last second he got connection lost or some memory problem or whatever, this will be the moment of the truth. This will be a negative experience which will override any positive aspects of the touch point. This is moment of truth. Obviously, you can also turn it into positive. For example, there might be a very long uh, interaction with the customer and you might do something which will embed in the customer's head something positive about it. In, 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 in the art I use, which is NLP, we call it anchoring, which means that you put a connection or association with what happened and the map of the world in the customer's head. Imagine the complaints department. We were fixing HSBC complaints department where people were calling because something was not working. And there were a couple of people in the call center who were taken from other banks and they were putting their own phrasing to the description of the process problem and putting into the instant management system. And uh, when the problem was fixed, they were calling the customer and trying to tell him what was fixed. Obviously, they couldn't because they didn't know what the customer said. They only got the rephrased sentence as the uh, agent on the call could remember. And the way we fixed it, and it basically put this net score promoter, whatever you, you call called here in, in today, to, to the top was that we were recording, we started recording verbatim what was the description of the problem, how the customer expressed it. And the way it worked is that when the problem was fixed, we could call the customer and say, Mr. John, two weeks ago, you called us and told us that, and there is a quote from his language, Ex extremely accurate description of what he said, and now this is fixed. And the way it works is that by the nature of the mind, when you have a verbal, ver verbatim quote from the customer and you say that it is fixed, what happens is that, based on this language, neural system goes to the brain, finds a place where it was logged as a problem for the customer, and you replace it with the positive experience of the problem being fixed. It's like replacing a file on disk. The memory works like that. And you turn this moment of truth, which was a horrible problem they had, with the warm feeling of, I called you, I followed up to the closure, it's done for you now. Could you please test it and confirm? Using simple anchoring and the precision of what the customer said to get back to him and replace in his head what was negative into positive. Very simple, very effective. Any questions to this? Excuse me, I want to ask about uh, a moment of truth and touch points. Uh, uh, the touch points are something like, uh, I want to precise it in my um, perceptual way. As the moments of truth are the applications are, um, first, the touch points are when uh, the client, the user, uh, communicates in some, in some way uh, with application, mm -hmm. and the uh, moments of truth uh, it's when the, ca the application communicates significantly uh, with the user. It's something like that? We can simplify it? You, you, can, you can name it as you wish. In, in my map of the world, okay. we were using usually these terms in such a way that the touch point is wherever the customer has any touch point with the brand. So it might be not even an application, but if they see the logo of the HSBC at any gate in, in Heathrow, then there is a touch point with the brand. We are putting his attention on the bank. If they fly in Warsaw and they see City Handlover, they, this is a touch point with the brand. So touch point is everything which is either imagined, remembered, or physical between the customer and your brand or product. The moment of truth, the way I was using it, 
is that within the touch points, there were many steps or possibilities for different interactions. And moment of truth in my model of this is that this is the moment, decisive moment, which decides which type of emotion is recorded in the brain where the customer is over the touch point. So even then, though you spend lots of money to create perfect application, or as one, one I think your company told about this uh, solution for, for this organization with this nice, nice setup, they didn't use it. So, yeah? so, 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 so this is what happened. The, the, the reality is it's not there. So moment of truth is this decisive moment within the touch point which decides how the entire touch point is remembered by the customer. It is a very important point which then sits in the memory and affects how the following touch points are evaluated. There is nothing like passive brain of the customer who in a detached fashion uses our application. Whatever we do, we communicate. We, we can't not communicate. Whatever we communicate is recorded by the brain, consciously or not, but it is there. The problem is, and we usually don't remember, that all the things which people experience are sitting in the map of the world as they have it and affects their behavior, even if they don't know about this. So you, in, in, the way you use the term is that the, the way you use the term. I just explain how I use them. Okay. Uh, thank you. This was this was a very a very special moment of proof for me. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question here from from Bishan. Uh, there is some theory in psychology about emotion that say that negative emotion are about five times stronger than positive emotion. So if we recall by this sentence this negative emotion and try to change it to positive emotion, there is some threshold. So how you deal with this threshold? Sometimes it's not possible to change it because of the strength of these negative emotions. Yeah, but this is why I use reframe. And you will hear it in the language, maybe. Let's give a horrible example, politicians. So politician A says, the problem is blah, 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 I want you to cover this with this. And the other guy completely ignores and says, no, the real issue is that. So we redirect attention. There is something which is in, in NLP, which is called recovery memory. The point is that when you really want to change the way people think, and you, you change it today because I explained to you how it works, is that you don't go into the past. You lay a new neural network, which you decide to use forever. And you can do this now, you can do this later, but you have to do this. Why don't at this specific moment? Because you hear to me, you hear me, and you know what I'm telling you. But also your subconscious mind is listening carefully and doing it. Yeah? You get the gist of it. The point is that whatever I'm saying is recorded in your brain. And I actually used language to propose the option for you to consider that in the future, you might just look at the emotion this way. OK? <laughs> I hope it works. Okay, uh, we got this hiccup with the uh, PC, but it's a very important thing which we <laughs> basically <laughs> wanted to start, which is this Buddhist meditation. I will just give you a gist of it as a taster, so you can, you can actually go there on your own time. Uh, the, the point is that many professionals who work in the customer experience therapy, psychotherapy, psychology, all these multidisciplinary guys, how do you think, how many of them got a formal lecture on the mind? Raise your hand and tell me, how many? In percentages. How many of you got any, any formal lecture in the university, after university courses, wherever you were trained, so that somebody defined mind for you? What is a mind? We see three people out of maybe, I don't know how many of us is, but the normal standard is about 2%. And I'm referring here to the real serious research by Daniel Siegel, who is the in, uh, author of the discipline called Interpersonal Neurobiology. And I will show him his books in a minute. And he asked this question of 100,000 leading professionals in the field of healing arts 
user and customer experience in the States and uh, around the globe. And about 2% of people have ever, ever heard about the mind. Why it is problem? Is a problem? Is a problem because they can't talk to each other about this subject. And as I agree with you and everybody who was talking to me before in these presentations today, we need an interdisciplinary effort to actually get this this thing out of the of the ground. So he proposed this type of definition, and I will read it because it's so precise and so beautiful. The mind can be defined as an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information within our bodies and within the relationships. And believe it or not, people from psychology, so, uh, sociology, uh, anthropologists, psychiatrists even, they agree that this is probably not a true statement, but we can use it as a model to have a significant conversation so that we can solve together how to make things better. Let, let me unpack this uh, for you. The mind itself correlates to the inner experience of being conscious or aware. Now, embodied means in the body. So this is a useful chart which actually explains it. The, somebody would say that oh, the mind is just what the brain does. And if you go to Cockprints, you can, you can download like 500 or more uh, interesting documentation of what the cognitive science today would say about the mind. Mind is just what the brain does. You can have this model, but is it the best one? Is it the best one, not in the sense of the ontological truth, is it the best one in terms of having some results done? So here we have this, uh, the brain as not just something which is sitting here. The brain is the extended neural system. You have lots of neurons in your stomach or around your heart. So this is why people say, you know what? I agree with you, but I have this gut feeling that something is not quite right. And this is what exactly these people are pointing to. They have lots of neurons somewhere else in muscle memory or a body memory which sense the emotion that maybe this rational process is not quite right. Correct? People say, peop you can't have the rational decision with him. He's, he's so emotional. But you know, if, if you really understand how it works, you would say there is no rational thinking be outside of emotions. Those people who don't feel emotions, so the amygdala is not working in the brain, they are psychopaths and they're usually sitting in supermaxes in the US. These guys who don't include emotions in their cognitive process are not healthy by any standard, especially American standard, this DSM-4 book with, with all these things. Somebody said today about the emerging processes, and I think, Wiesław, you were talking lots of emergence. So the mind, is the emergent process of how the system self-organizes, how the brain which is sitting in the, in, in the body, based on its relationships with everything which happens, gives rise to this system which regulates energy and information flow. And Daniel Ziegel is using the term information in a specific sense. He says that if you have data, this is just pure data and energy. If you have, en if you have a data about this energy, so there's some meta-representation, then it is information, yes? If I say this is a pen, it's just a pen. But if I say this is the pointer, which is give an operational definition, it gives me much more. I have some information about it. It's not just the plastic. And I have to go very fast. I have three slides, okay? How much time? Okay, let's, let's define what the mind side is. Uh, this is not about religion. Uh, I have no links with any religion. I have no certification to talk about any religion. But I have certification in neurolinguistic programming. So our viewpoint on the mind side is that it is the interpretation of the mindfulness vipassana meditation which was practiced for thousands of years in, 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 in India and, and Japan and places, which is the developing of the ability to see the internal world of self and others, on top of perceiving their behaviors. So if you practice mindfulness process, you get what Daniel Ziegel called mind sight, which means that you are not just thinking, you can see your brain thinking. So when I gave you all this uh, complex charts about how the subjective experience is generated, with this mind doing the filtering and modifying, when you practice mindfulness, you can actually see this happening in your head. I am serious. This happens after a couple of weeks of practice, which is as simple as focusing your attention on your breath, for example,
without distraction to anything else. Two tricks. You have to, you have to be aware of what you are doing, and you have to put attention to your intention, which means that if you sit in the meditation position or whatever on the chair, and you want to focus on your breath, I guarantee you would not be able to maintain it over more than half a minute because your brain will start flashing, flashing all these things it is designed to do. The brain is there to give you everything to think about which might require your attention. But you want to have this quiet moment. So if you first may visualize maybe yourself sitting there peacefully focusing on the breath without any distraction, and you can do this vividly, what you actually did, you send the message to your brain as a command to actually give you this behavior. We got this attractors thing today from you, guess what? And it's exactly this. Willpower doesn't work. But if you can program your mind by putting in your future memory the picture of yourself meditating with a clear mind focusing on your breath, it will happen because you just programmed it in into your behavior, correct? So with time, this type of mindful state of awareness will habituate, or as they say, the the state will turn into the trait, which means that it will become your unconscious competence, it will be the default behavior. And two paradigms which are extremely important here, and really, really go to YouTube and enter neuroplasticity, or do mirror, mirror neurons. There are two things which are quite new in neurobiology, that may be new about 10 years, taken seriously, and neuroplasticity is about, for example, people, people like myself, which are 50 plus, but I never got this type of ability to learn new things as I have now, because I use neuroplasticity. I depend on this capacity of my brain to rewire itself all the time and to learn, to establish new neurons, neuronal networks. And you can hear from people something like uh, uh, neurons which fire together, wire together. This is, uh, every seven years you have new, do you know that you have new body in seven years? You know it. Certain parts of your body, like stomach, I think it take changes even quicker. You actually eat yourself in the digestion program. So, so what happens is that the body rewires, replaces itself. And also from the, uh, for the brain and the extended neuron, uh, nervous system, there's a capacity for the brain to build new neurons and establish new connections. And now when you focus your attention, and as we say in mindfulness, you use your healing beam of awareness and you deal with yourself in awareness of mindful meditation, you actually rewire your brain and you create these neural networks which completely change you. You're a different person after the meditation. When, when I have a customer and I deal with my customer, I want him to be a different person after the call with me and it always happens because I know that I can facilitate establishing new net networks in his brain. So that we are changing the brain by the way we focus our attention. Is it, is it amazing? It is. I think it is. And the second one is this mirror, mirror neurons. <sighs> I talk to you a lot about the representations. The most interesting part of the representation process in your brain is that it can model not only its own state, but the state of the other person. I just got this vivid when you talk about love and these two pulsating things is that this is like one brain representing the state of the brain of the other person and this other person representing the state of the other person. So what you hear about the things like emotional intelligence or empathy specifically is that I'm not just feeling for you because I know you got divorced, you are sad. You are a sad person, you know, you are, you are depressed. I can actually feel it because my neural network can resonate to the state of your brain and give me this in emotion and feeling. It's amazing. I, I have my brain modeling your state. I can be you for a moment. Yeah? So it's extremely, extremely important. Obviously, this is for your self-development as the person who will be doing customer experience, but also you want to use these things when you do your application. It's like uh, like, like, like Piotr said, that they don't quite often change with the check with the customer what is the impact of it before going live. This would be so useful to get the customer to see it 
see with the customer, sit with the customer, and actually model how he experiences your application. So then you become relevant to the customer because you start understanding and feeling how they feel about your application is not your projection, or as we call uh, mind reading in NLP, is the actual thing. And maybe this one. Uh, when you practice mindfulness, you, you start seeing that it's actually true that the map being not the territory, it's not just some slogan or some cycle bubble. It is the actual thing. You start feeling that the map is the map and the territory is the map is the territory. If you feel some emotions, you say, yes, I'm frustrated, but this frustration is not about reality. It's about how you respond to what's happening. There's nothing like interesting book or frustrating, dummy, stupid film. There's a film there but you can make it even interesting when you relate to this in a proper manner. Emotion which is there is not a part of reality. This is why the language lies. This is a simple lie. There's nothing like an interesting film. It might be the film which for a certain audience might be interesting because it meets the expectations, future, past memories. There's nothing like a dual product. If it specifies and, and delivers on specific Mm, parameters which were required, it might be sexy or it might be interesting because you build it in such a way that the customer responds to this like that. And uh, somebody said about consciousness today and how it is generated. I just, just want you to focus on one sentence which is absolutely fantastic. And it comes from the book by Richard Dawkins, Selfish Gene, which is a very old book. But the guy actually got this very good uh, idea that there's no life on Earth, there are just genes and DNA which replicates. And he said, after a couple of hundreds of pages, he says, so if, if the human body is just a survival machine for DNA to replicate, why the hell we are conscious? And this brings down to this flight simulator idea, and Richard Dawkins says something like that. Perhaps consciousness, which is ability to be aware, arises when the brain simulation of the world becomes so complete that it must include a model of itself. And English is very precise, and this is why I like this language to talk about customer experience, because in English you can say, I have a sense of self, I have a sense of time, I have a sense of my ego, I have a sense of being a conscious decision maker and having a willpower. This, this word sense, it's fantastic because it, it basically means that the nervous system is producing this sense, which I was trying to explain to you over the last couple of minutes. Now, if, if we can still afford a minute, I really want you to remember this, and it gets, gets with my, you know, uh, with my gray hair and lots of hard kicks lessons from, from, from the life. You need to develop sensitivity required to appreciate that every human being is a masterpiece. Whatever stupid his map of reality might be, it is just about the map. The person is unique, is a masterpiece. You can't change people's behavior directly, but you can create options for them by allowing them to see the map of reality they have from different perspectives. And this is what you should do with your products and applications. You want these people to have the choice or either to respond to this the way that normally you would, or you want to lead them and guide them and guide them to have a different perspective. And this is about the rapport, which I couldn't find the equivalent in Polish. This is about building the link with your customer when you are appreciating the world from the map of this other person. So you can really understand and appreciate and help. Extremely important. Now, this, this is an interesting picture. This, this is uh, uh, done by, by Krzysztof Iwin, who maybe is known for those who uh, like to use death metal, as I do. And, and Polish group Yattering and a couple of other um, groups which have fantastic graphics on it. Kind of like Bekszynski, you know, very, very scary, <laughs> very, very, very different. But he's also painting things like that. And this is, this is uh, I got a conversation with him because he was the second person I, I ran my presentation through. And basically he told me that this is what I understand of what you told me. And his interpretation is as follows. We have this illusion that if we see the world and the mirror, and we see our reflection in the mirror, we believe that reflection is a fake because the reflection and everything is real. 
This is the first problem, because even what we see here, solid reality, and even see our bodies, this is all generated by the brain. This is all experience, it's not reality. We have a map of our body, okay? And some people will see themselves and don't like it. And what's happening here in this portrait is that this is actually a mirror. So you can see reflection of the frame. So what's happening here is that this painter is painting over the mirror the image of himself which he really believes should override what he sees reflected. And the fallacy of this is that you can't change reality by changing the image. Okay? And <laughs> actually, the, the, the real origin of this picture is that as a part of my story to him and showing him the presentation, I said that when I was working as a programmer for, for fairly 20 years doing C, C++ on VMS and Unix, we, we got this joke. Uh, do you know what Tipex is? Like this white structure some people use to override something printed on paper. So we could say, how do you know that certain programmer is not that experienced? And, and, and the answer to this joke is that you will see lots of tipex on his screen. Yeah? And, and this is similar, that you, you have a person who is actually trying to change reality by updating reflection, which is complete fallacy. But uh, I, I would just uh, invite you to go to his Galeria Brahma Art PL to see lots of paintings, which he's like a fantastic painter who is able to show you emotions of people. I learn a lot from seeing his painters, paintings where you can actually see people with this eye movements, body language, which actually uh, allow you to understand better how people process emotions. This is my takeaway for you. This is customer experience from Beyond Philosophy. These are actually the books I got from Ragu on a day when he sold customer experience to me. Start with the building great customer experiences, revolutionize customer experience in DNA, which is the book about the values. This is from some, some other guy, also fantastic book. In terms of emotions, you will get the uh, Joseph uh, Ledoux, if I pronounce properly, uh, two seminal books which explain almost everything you can, you can have to know about emotions. The same as uh, Dimasio, who is saying the body and emotion for the meaning of consciousness. It's a fantastic book, really good to hear. It's actually putting together, put, putting apart Cartesian theater where there is this dualism between body and mind. And, and he's saying how fallacious it is and what is the damaging effect of this type of thinking when you have duality between so-called mind and body in everything we do. Then obviously this guy, uh, I can't pronounce the name, I never could, there's the user illusion. I find, you might find this book extremely useful because you will have like, this like the encyclopedia of different models representing how this consciousness is generated, how subjective experience is generated, how emotions are generated. He basically says that our body is doing what he would call creating the user's illusion of consciousness. Fascinating book in, in simple language really. Now, here's mindfulness uh, story with uh, Daniel Ziegel. Uh, I would start with the developing mind. This is the book written maybe 10 years ago, where he says how it is that the brain works like it works. Then 10 years later, basically, uh, it was uh, end of last year, or this year, he got, he got this, I finish in a second. <laughs> I thought you want to silence me. It was very simple, switch it off. This, this book, this book, uh, second edition, he actually got a grant in the States to get 20 students of the cognitive science, and he gave them a very simple task. He said, whatever was presented as a model of developing mind and brain and mindfulness based on Buddhist meditation, now you have one year to go into the field and find any model, any literature, any finding to collapse this model. So basically validate and prove it. And they were not able to, uh, to uh, collapse this model. And this book basically is a rewrite of this one, basically having all the new cognitive science and neurobiology biology input. Fantastic read. And he has a, uh, to me, I don't know how he does it. I would love to, to know it. But he's telling you the story, the narrative, which you can actually follow. He has this, uh, go to YouTube, Daniel S. Ziegel, and as you see here and go for something like the Ziegel, go to the model of the brain 
in, in, in the hand. And he will explain to you how amygdala works, how hippocampus works, how all this cortex works, and you will really understand, because if you don't understand it, you can't be consciously producing user in, in interfaces. Uh, there's another thing which I want to just burn in your mind before, before I finish. This thing. Do you guys read Donald Norman at all? He wrote this book, Emotional Design. In Britain, they would say design for emotions, because I can be emotional when I design, and I can design crap. But this is the way to remember this, emotional design. And uh, living with complexity, he says that some interfaces or products like Apple have to be very simple, but the world is not simple. The world is complex, and he explains why certain things are better off if they are complex. But imagine, you know, this is 68, 1968, psychology review toward a memory, theory of memory attention. Do you know why this guy is so productive? Why on YouTube we have thousands of uh, uh, references to him and, and, and free talks you can, you can listen, especially from USLA, which is one of these universities in California. Because he was a cognitive scientist. He understood how the brain works. And believe me, if you understand the basics of the brain, you really get it right in your head, you'll be immensely more effective when you actually do design, because you will not do design in terms of certain roles or principles. You'll actually consider how the brain works, and you consider that your design is for the brain. <laughs> you're not doing it for the market, because you simulate with your product what you want this brain to do. So maybe I will stop on this, and if you have uh, a minute for questions, then I will take them. I see that we don't have time, but I am here, so um, this is, okay, I'm here on my own time. I work now for a completely different company than I work when I was doing this. This is my absolute passion, and whoever wants to talk to me, welcome. You have reference to my email and uh, uh, Skype. So contact me if you need to know anything about this to guide you, whatever. That's it. Thank you very much. Teraz będzie przerwa, e, jakieś 10 minut i o, e, za 5 e, piąta zaczniemy następny wykład Erika Brążiera.